Australia's got huge resources, but our best natural resources are older people. And uh, the research supports this, and we're not tapping into that. And that uh, is just not doing it justice to the children. But in, in addition, the, the older people, be they in residential aged care or be they living at home alone or retirement living, but it's purposeful for elders. They can impact in a positive way the, the behaviour, the learnings and lifestyles of these children. Silver Adventures is a content and technology company dedicated to improving the lives of older adults through immersive virtual reality experiences. And this podcast is our opportunity to hear from industry experts, thought leaders, and passionate individuals to share with you their knowledge, expertise, and experiences. Welcome to the Age Care Enrichment Podcast. Hello, welcome to the show. I'm your host, Ash Deneef, and I hope you're having a great day out there and you're ready for more in-depth conversations about aged care. I certainly am. Our episode today is featuring Greg Cronin from Intergenerational Learning Australia, and he shares with us a lot of the transformative benefits that collaborative learning programs can have for both older adults and children. One of the things that Greg talks about is the personal connections that participants in these programs develop and how they can improve the quality of life and engagement for both parties. We also feature a little snippet of audio from Greg's work in this chat, and you can hear one of the classroom sessions unfolding, as well as some of the participants giving their feedback. I should also mention that Greg has joined the Silver Adventures Board of Advisors, and we're delighted to have him. You'll hear us chat a bit more about his role at the end. Now, for those of us who've been spending a lot of time on video calls lately, you'll hear something quite familiar in this episode, a shaky internet connection. But don't worry, everything is clear and understandable, but there are just a few moments where the quality of the sound changes a bit. Anyway, that's enough from me. We hope you enjoy this conversation with Greg Cronin. Well, Greg, thanks so much for joining us on the program today. Thanks, Ash. Thanks for your time and thanks for your interest. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a pleasure. And for those of our listeners who don't know what you're doing, could you give us a bit of your background and your work? My background has actually been the technical design of audiovisual systems. Many aged care organisations in retirement villages would have a, uh, a cinema, perhaps, or a, a meeting room for staff, and not quite often there'd be a video conference system involved with that. So my role was to uh, design the video conference systems, uh, the digital signage, and also when it comes to hospitals, aged care and other places, uh, the nurse call systems and the security access control. Mm-hmm. When I speak with one aged care organisation, they were interested to have a competitive edge uh, for their new retirement village. Mm-hmm. So after doing some research about what's happening with reti- retirement in the US and parts of Asia and Europe, lifelong learning was a theme. So I came back to the organisation and said, look, uh, have you considered lifelong learning and using the video conference equipment purchase for staff and for organisational resources for um, programs that can enable residents and elders, retirees, to keep on learning. Fantastic. So when we're talking about lifelong learning there, is that what does that look like? Yeah, really good question. So lifelong learning is actually uh, actively participating in a course. So either studying that particular course, it could be a university course or a TAFE course. And uh, some universities in the US actually build aged care facilities or retirement villages on campus. At the opposite end of the spectrum to tertiary students are uh, getting elders involved in walking into a classroom, be it a preschool or primary school or secondary school. And similarly, either actively participate in those lessons or assist and mentor those students. Fantastic. And and I understand that you've done some research into those interactions that you mentioned there between students and elders. What are the benefits of these intergenerational interactions? So for over 40 years, uh, the research shows that co-located intergenerational programs are programs where um, the aged care facility or retirement village is purpose-built adjacent to an early childhood centre or a preschool or even a school. Being co-located, that means that uh, one age group can freely visit the other or in in a structured way as such. But also uh, the younger students can see the elder people as they're walking past and or be involved in some sort of structured or unstructured activity. That's the co-located environment. The visitation model is the second model, which basically um, the elders would visit the school and participate in the, the classroom lesson. So the area that got me curious was that um, 
I was looking at technology and how could technology, visual communications technology, play a role in intergenerational programs. And what I did all sorts of research to try and find video conferencing or Skype-based or FaceTime and other activities using video conferencing to connect older and younger people. I couldn't find anything actually linked up with the school curriculum topics. So how could it be personally meaningful for the elders involved in addition to the students involved, mm. but align with the curriculum topics and do it on a weekly basis so that uh, we could get learning outcomes and measure those learning outcomes for both age groups. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of different elements to, to balance there. And I guess hidden in that word sustainable is the fact that a lot of work needs to happen online now. We need to be interacting virtually. And am I correct in, in that a key feature of your research as well was connecting people virtually? Correct, yes. So we the idea behind the video conferencing was to complement the co-located and visitation models. Mm -hmm. Periods of being the same physical space of elders and children is fantastic because we, we there's a different dynamic involved. Mm -hmm. So the question was, how well could this work in a virtualized environment using video conferencing? And we we're confident that we get some good results, but we we're quite amazed that it was as impactful for both age groups as it was. We found that by these weekly interactions, the behaviour of these students was modified enormously. For example, one student, this goes back to 2019, if he wasn't at the principal's office every day, he was there multiple times a day. We decided to place this particular student into the video conference and talk with the elders. And he actually liked talking to one of the elders who was 94 years of age. After that particular video call, we recorded an interview with this young student, uh, 11 years of age. And he mentioned how much he loved talking with this older gentleman, Norm. He was quite engaged with Norm because this student liked to talk with his grandfather in years past. But two years ago, his grandfather actually passed away. When he spoke with Norm, he said, it was, I felt like I was talking to my grandpa again. Mm. I asked the teacher to observe that particular student for Thursday afternoon and Friday. I got a text message back from the teacher to say, this student's been awesome. He's so looking forward to talking to Norm next week. There are many stories like that. And also the teacher has said many, many times that after each of the video calls, the behaviour of students, it's just wonderful. There's a real calmness is the thing that's come across these students. Mm. So in essence, we, we've noticed we can change the life trajectories of these children, but also we have a knowledge resource bank of elders with life experience and learnings that we're not tapping into. Australia's got huge resources, mm. but our best natural resources are older people. And uh, the research supports this, and we're not tapping into that. And that uh, is just not doing it justice to the children. But in, in addition, the, the older people, be they in residential aged care or be they living at home alone or retirement living, but it's purposeful for elders. They can impact in a positive way the, the behaviour, the learnings and lifestyles of these children. For the teachers too, there's been a great impact on teachers. They see different personalities develop in their students. They see self-confidence develop. They see the quiet ones wanting to volunteer. And uh, within the aged care home context at least, some comments from the facility manager have been that um, the elders involved just after two weeks of video calls. So it's two lots of 45 minutes. So the context for this and background is that these two groups of one group of school students, so year six students, over age of 11, and the elders ranging age from 74 to 97, with a range of cognitive decline and cultural backgrounds and language backgrounds. But after two video calls, there were less, less nighttime nurse call requests, which means uh, by deduction, residents are sleeping better, the elders are sleeping better. Mm. Less negativity when it comes to discussions with staff and about meals. One particular gentleman who was uh, 94 years of age would come down to the facility manager, Karen, each day and wants to know who he needs to speak to to sack her because she doesn't know how to run the place properly, even though it's very well run. And secondly, who does he need to speak to to sack the chef because he can't even do bang as a mash properly? So while this might sound trivial, uh, it was affecting this gentleman's health and the health of others because he would not eat his meals, even though the meals were excellent. Mm. And at meal times, because of his confrontational sort of uh, manner, others would not want to eat. They would, feel like they would not feel in a good mood to eat, so they're losing weight. But um, since the video call, she said that this particular gentleman has not come to her office. He's actually engaging more in staff. He's not as confrontational. 
the residents have something more to talk about rather than just uh, bingo or the news. Uh, they, they're connected to the children. They love talking about the children or the anecdotes, the, the jokes that the children talk about or tell. But because the topics are based on the school curriculum, we're drawing back and drawing upon the memories and lifestyles and experiences, personally meaningful experiences as older, older people. So memory recall, reminiscing is great for both delaying the onset of dementia and diminishing its severity. Mm -hmm. So there are a whole range of benefits. And last but not least, the active participants are the students and the elders. But the passive participants are really the teachers and the aged care staff. Mm -hmm. So what we found is that teachers are also getting involved. We all have some lineage, grandparents, great-grandparents, somewhere on the line, uh, living or have passed away. But it's a real connection to the teacher, as well as the effect it has on staff in the aged care home in this context is that they love hearing the sound of children. They love hearing the laughter. They love seeing the residents happier. Mm. There's happier interactions. And that calmness and happiness lingers throughout the day and the following days. It's also something that the residents look forward to, and it's a reward for them. This is before COVID, but even more relevant during COVID. So it's a very uh, long snapshot of the program, mm -hmm. but look forward to any questions you may have. Yeah, that's fantastic. Greg, I think... Um It'd be really great to hear. I think you've brought with you a clip that we could put in now just to hear a little bit about the program and, and what it sounds like when it's going on. We have been learning how to write different types of poems. In small groups, we have written a limerick about each of you. And our poem is for Helen. Are you ready? Helen. Yeah. Are you ready, Helen? Okay. Helen's classes were so much fun. Her ex-students say she's number one. She loved to teach French. From a little bench. Bonjour! Is how her lesson begun. <laughs> <laughs> well, my grandparents have passed away, so I don't usually get the opportunity to um, speak to elderly people of like, a different generation, so it gives me the opportunity to um, learn about what life was like for them. I would probably help out with the old people more because, like, there's not as many people that are interested in that kind of stuff anymore. And if we're not going to do that, then, like, when we get older, there's going to be no one there to help us when we need it. Well, I was uh, teaching for 20 years and I'm uh, 95 years old now. Now, the one... That pupil that got a bit of time for me that uh, he was playing up and I talked to him on but he seemed to improve his language. I wouldn't like to see him, I don't not paying favourites, would like to see how he finishes up. Yes. Throughout the next year. I've got an attachment to him for not as for the view of the others. I want to see how they all go, you know. That's personal. Yeah, that's fantastic. And lots of stuff to dig into there. I wanna wind it back to you know, the topic of your research and identifying whether or not the conducting these sessions virtually, if that had any sort of impact on the quality of them, that's probably, I mean, I've been wondering that throughout the pandemic when I'm seeing friends on Zoom, does it diminish the sort of interaction that we're having? How did you measure that it, it doesn't impact at all on the, the quality of, of the interaction? Oh, very good. A few ways. We do surveys before uh, the start of any video call through for the year or for that school term. Mm -hmm. And we have a range of questions such as anticipation or expectations of the video call, a range of other questions such as uh, would these children like to consider working in aged care homes or with older people? Mm. A yes, no answer. In one sentence, explain the reason. We also send surveys out to questionnaires to the parents, get parental permission, of course. We do record the videos both for research as well as for uh, reviewing for pleasure. Um, but at the end of the, we also do other, other measurements as far as surveys on uh, five categories, five lists for the students, because we're talking about a learning environment here. How many new words do they hear through each video call? How many new phrases are they hearing? What types of vocalizations do they hear in the video call to understand the deeper understanding of communication? So, vocalizations, I mean, uh, utterances, uh, giggles, laughters, uh -huh, mm's, et cetera. The use of nonverbal cues, so the, the, the facial expressions, hand gestures, body movements, head nodding. Mm. So really deeper diving for the students to be more observant and more attentive about what they're hearing and what they're seeing and also what they're sensing. Three categories, very important. Mm -hmm. And the fifth category is basically learning the content. 
So the course is tied in with the curriculum. It may be what, what they're learning about a critical history topic or English topic or poet mm -hmm. or uh, technology or history, etc. So the way we measure the, the, the impact on these students is both the number of words they're learning each week. In addition to that, um, we do the same survey at the end of the term or end of the year. Uh, so questions such as, would you like to work with older people as a career? And yes, no answer. There's an increase to yes. Mm -hmm. So there's an increase. There's a positive change that yes, they'd like to work with older people. And the reasons why, they didn't realise that older people would be so, be so interesting to speak with, and speak to. Uh, they're just like us, but just with more wrinkly skin. Mm -hmm. you know, all these verbatim, sort of, all those sort of insights. Because the, these children, be it primary school or secondary school, in this context of primary school, uh, a lot of them are more exposed to digital devices and TVs and limited family time together. Mm. But uh, the fact that we are deliberately uh, putting it in front of older people, and the key also, too, is that when they interact with the older people, it's not just uh, a laptop sitting in front of um, 12 to 15 older people. In a classroom, that the size of the face of that person would be the size of a P, basically. Mm -hmm. That's a slight exaggeration, but you don't get the key facial expressions. We started that way, and it does work. So when it comes to technology, all you need to kick off with is a laptop and a speakerphone. Mm -hmm. So at least we can hear each other clearly and see each other clearly. But we decided that part of the design was to use a motorised camera to zoom in right. on the face of, a, of an older adult and a student for two reasons. In the classroom, we try to have the face of the older person close enough to full screen. So the students who are four or five metres back can see the twinkle in the eye or the nose twitch or the cheek muscles grin. And there's a science behind that to do with the vagus nerve and the polyvagal theory by Professor Steve Porges. So um, reading those facial cues but sensing those cues in addition to what we hear and see is very important to our biology. We're talking sort of anthropology now. As a mammal, we hear things, we see things, we also sense things. So likewise, for the older persons in the aged care home, their eyesight's diminishing. So we use at least a 65 to 75 inch TV screen. And we also zoom in on the students' faces. Mm. And not all schools can afford a, a motorised camera like that. So what we do in the classroom is get two students sitting up close in front of the laptop so their faces are nice and close to the camera. Mm -hmm. But we elevate the laptop so we still see the students in the background. So technology and the cost of technology should not be a barrier. But the advantage and reason we do that is to get the students' faces closer is that, of course, older people's eyesight can start to diminish. So the bigger the image on the screen for the older people, the more immersive the experience. Mm -hmm. And again, the older people can see the twinkle in the eyes and cheek muscles and all the sort of gestures of the, of the child. So, uh, so there's certain ways we measure the outcomes, both in um, qualitative ways as far as writing and responses, okay? Mm -hmm. And we've yet to look at the quantitative way. So the, the future area for research in this space is how does this change uh, more practical things such as um, heart rate? How, how does it affect the, the, the physiology of the person, the calmness? How do we measure that? We can measure that. So nurse call requests at night time, they can be measured. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't done that as such yet, but anecdotally comments from staff have told us that. But... Um, other areas to the interests aged care organisations are pain management and pain medication. Mm. So with the feel-good endorphins of uh, serotonin that can really Im improve the mood, is there a correlation in between reducing pain management, um, pain medication rather, sorry. Mm. So uh, yes, there are ways to measure improvements both for the elders, similar surveys for the elders as for the students. This episode is sponsored by Ending Loneliness Together. I just felt a sadness inside. I've never spoken to anyone about feeling lonely. I've never spoken to my, my family. I think I always try to show I'm well, especially to the kids. They'd never imagine that I felt lonely. Over 5 million Australians are lonely. While we all feel lonely from time to time, longer periods of loneliness are damaging to our health and well-being. Ending Loneliness Together is a national Australian charity with the vision to halve chronic loneliness by 2030. We all have a role to play in ending loneliness. Consider making a donation, becoming a member, or sharing your story with others. Go to www.endingloneliness.com.au for more information. 
Yeah, fantastic. Sounds like there's lots of different types of data to look at there. I'm wondering when you're talking about this, that there's all these these range of benefits. It it sounds like the curriculum is framing the conversations with relation to the school curriculum is a structure, but it's not necessarily the focus of, of the interactions. It sounds like the the social benefits, the emotional benefits almost outweigh the sort of the knowledge benefits they get out of it. That's a really good point. Uh, it is about social interactions, it's about building relationships. The curriculum is the framework. Okay. Mm. And on that point too, it's a reciprocal learning process. So it needs to be mutually engaging and personally meaningful for as many of the participants as possible. So while we do have the school curriculum topics each week amongst the whole range of subjects you typically expect in school, it's also interesting to ask the elders what topics are interest of them. Mm. So their sports, their careers, where they've travelled. And it's a great way for students to also learn about uh, the experiences of older people. Implicit to that too is the English curriculum, in year six at least, the students need to write a biography. Mm -hmm. So rather than writing a biography about a famous person and going to Google and search the internet, they get together in groups and they'll interview uh, each of the residents. Mm, Wow, that's great. So it's a practical application. So it must be a reciprocal, bi-directional learning interaction that's mutually enjoyable. Mm. And that's the bottom line. It is an enjoyable experience for the students. And the elders. I'm wondering here because uh, if you're pairing 11 year olds or, or sixth grade with people who are in a residential care home, this could kind of work with people in, in all sorts of different settings. Is the choice to use residents of a care home, is it a practical one or is it something specifically you're trying to address with people who are living in care? Good. On the research side of things, it's a, it's a convenience sample. Mm-hmm. So the school is only a few kilometres away, as is the aged care home. Uh, so technically to be able to get to both locations and uh, having knowledge about the school and the aged care home made it easier to introduce the program. But the design and strategy of this program is to use it for elder persons in whatever environment that may be. So we have three environments. We have residential aged care homes or facilities. We have retirement living facilities or independent living units. Mm-hmm. And we also have home and community care, elders living at home alone. And that's the one. The other reason why we chose video conferencing. And recently, we've invited persons from home to join us. We've had people from mm. in the Sydney area, Randwick, which is uh, near the Bondi, Sydney's eastern suburbs, Wollongong, which is an hour and a half south of Sydney, and Greystones, a suburb of Western Sydney. So the age group of um, Diana is in her late seventies. The lady from Wollongong, uh, Val, she's ninety-two, and midway through her degree in dementia care. Mm. Brilliant lady. Yeah. And Frank, who's a war veteran. So um, certainly we want to trial it in an aged care home because it's a more controlled environment and it's a group setting. Mm. So it was interesting to see how that works and how the dynamics work. And now we're going out to getting elders involved within their own home. Several reasons for that is that we know the age group over 65 is going to double in the next 15 to 20 years. And the age group 85 and above is going to quadruple in the same time period. We also know that the aged care industry has gone through uh, a lot of change due to the Aged Care Royal Commission and other sort of media and so on, mm. and that uh, the government pushes to have people age at home. So we're going to be living longer and living at home longer. Um, part of the problem with that is that a lot of people who have good health will be living at home a lot longer, but perhaps without that social support next to them. Mm. So at least by video conferencing in a meaningful way, that's one way to engage them, get the mental stimulation going mm-hmm. and to engage and meet other people, meet new friends especially meeting the school students. Yeah. Well, you can see a, a situation where it becomes sort of a social club for older adults if, if they're living at home that, you know, Tuesday mornings at 10, I, I check in and, and we have some fun with the kids and it's a conversation and I'm always there for that conversation and that could be something to look forward to throughout the week. And it's also both age groups have used the term, it's a responsibility they've got. Mm. The school students, sorry, say that we're, we're looking forward to meeting next week because we're, we're going to follow up on what Rex or what normal Audrey or Margaret had to say, mm. or I've got something to show them next week. And likewise, the comments from the elders is that um, we're connected to these students now. We want to know how they go through school. You know, we have a responsibility to be here each week yeah. apart from the reward. So the reward factor is also very big. They look forward to it. It's something novel, not because it's something fun to do, which it is. But it's over because it's it's got purpose and meaning behind it for, for all participants. Is there something about eleven year olds as well, or that age group that responds better to these sorts of interactions? Have you tried with older students or younger students? Yeah, another really good question. We've tried it with different age groups. 
uh, both in high schools and uh, primary schools. So with year four students and year one students, year four students engage very well in conversation. Mm. And we, but with the year one students, there was less conversation. We had it for only a 15 to 20 minute period of time. But the best way to describe the visual impact of these year one students, 30 of these six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, wriggled and could not sit still. It was like watching a can of worms, <laughs> okay? which was just so appealing. that The elders just loved their visual image. They just smiled. Mm. And they enjoyed what the children had to ask about, such as um, what school they went to, how well they were in uh, year five or year six or year one, and uh, a range of other very simple questions as such. Mm. So, again, it's the experience. It's a very positive experience. The conversation's great, but it's just the being together part is critical, yeah. Yeah, I can see that. And, and I know that around Australia, I've heard about a, a place in Perth that's doing this and in, in Queensland as well, aged cares that are building childcare centres attached to the residential complex. Maybe there's a, a chance here. I don't know if, if you've looked at, at this combination, but it could be sort of a, a less structured approach as well if, if the kids are just coming in and, and actually being with the older adults. Yeah, very good. To your point about um, intergenerational communities, uh, the New South Wales government has... Uh, certainly been reviewing this area and there's the office of new south wales crown land and the office of the commissioner of new south wales crown land who are talking and looking to partner with a range of organizations be it property developers be it education organizations schools aged care organizations early childhood organizations uh, affordable living housing organizations to look at um, partnering and developing intergenerational communities because we know that, um, that we know the benefits of getting these two age groups to to link together and to uh, be more active together. So there's certainly a, the New South Wales government has got to be pushing that space to um, foster intergenerational communities, and that does commence by looking at developing an aged care home on site with an early childhood centre. There's also another excellent example of Wellington, New South Wales. They've recently just built a preschool mm-hmm. as part of an aged care facility. And it's one of Australia's first purposeful intergenerational communities, backed by research from Griffith University and Professor Fitzgerald. So intergenerational programs don't necessarily always need to involve really, really old people with really, really young people. Parents and children, that's intergenerational. Yeah. You know, grandparents and children, it's intergenerational. But the context in particular I'm talking here is engaging really old people who have a lot of resource and wisdom and knowledge to share with us and perhaps are living quite alone and very lonely and isolated and trying to get them engaged back in the community and with the school students for, for the mutual benefit. Mm. Now, what does this program look like or what does this type of program look like, say, 15 years in the future? Where do you imagine it going? Very good. We've got, as I mentioned before, 15 to 20 years' time, the age group over 65 is going to double yeah. and the age group over 85 is going to quadruple. So we have um, certainly within uh, the Sydney area uh, several hundred thousand students uh, and many thousands of teachers. We know the reciprocal learning benefits, health and behaviour benefits of this program. So to scale this and implement this into the curriculum is the goal. There's so many benefits to both age groups, but also at a societal level. Uh, it's a regrettable comment to make, but we're still warehousing older people to the side and not seeing the value in them, mm. much to the detriment of our society. So the goal is to expand us nationally. I've already got interest from New Zealand, so there's international interest as well, uh, because it's a common theme in most Westernised societies or any societies that have been influenced by Western culture, mm. more to the point. Uh, so yes, certainly to scale it. So we talked with government agencies. We're talking with various ministers, both federal and state, and uh, a range of education organisations and HQ organisations set up nationally. So when you and I chat in the next six to 12 months, I'll be able to come back to you and say it's happening in each state and we're scouting it. That's the other key to this as well. Any research to be worthwhile needs to be robust and needs to be sustainable. Mm. So we designed this program to have minimal impact on staff workflow in the aged care home and also the school, and to be easy to implement and to minimise technology so that you increase user adoption. The other key or the other reason programs fail is a lack of ongoing support. So we designed into this program ongoing support because you get champions that come to an organisational school, then they go. Then typically the program falls over. Mm-hmm. So it's been designed to, to be sustainable. So love to talk to policymakers, both federal and state, in education, aged care, and also um, uh, social welfare. 
I've got the benefits of this. Yeah, that'd be amazing to have every kid go through school with this sort of experience and, and extra resources and, and people to kind of bounce off all the way through. It'd be very exciting. Greg, I couldn't let you go without mentioning that you've just joined the Silver Adventures Board of Advisors. And I think there's probably a lot of crossovers between your work with intergenerational learning and Silver Adventures work in VR. Yeah, great. I really look forward to uh, being on the Board of Advisors. I've been looking at what Silver Adventures has been doing over the last two years. And it's really intrigued me the area of virtual reality. <clears throat> the effect that it, ha- it can have on a whole range of older persons, especially I saw one where a lady with dementia was quite distressed uh, when the virtual reality headset was placed upon her, looking at some nice scenes of uh, underwater worlds or barrier reefs and so on, tropical fish, had an immediate calming effect on this lady. But mm. where I'm interested to explore this further is to get the students and the elders to be looking at the same type of virtual reality video. For example, it could be environmental videos as such. It could be a space exploration. These are typical topics the students discuss in primary and high schools. But in order to get a deeper level of learning, it would be certainly interesting to get both age groups to view the same VR video as such and use that as a point of discussion when they meet in the video calls because they're both at the same mm. point of reference. And from that, we can then expand into conversations about what does Rex, Norman, Audrey and Margaret think about the environment? How has it changed? And likewise, get perspectives from the students. Yeah, well, we're really excited to have you on board. And as you said, the interaction afterwards is going to be really amazing to to have that as a launching point for further discussions. Where can people find out more before we, we leave it there for today? So the website is the first place to go to. That's www.intergenerational-learning.com.au. There's an email address on there. You can just click on that. Well, Greg, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time, Ash. Have a good day. Well, we hope you enjoyed this episode of the Age Care Enrichment Podcast, brought to you by Silver Adventures. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening. And if you're enjoying it, please leave us a review. We'd really appreciate it. If you're interested in finding out how immersive virtual reality experiences can enrich the lives of older adults, visit the Silver Adventures website today at www.silver.com.au. See you next week.